Section 76 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Mr. and Mrs. Curtis. It was about two o'clock on the following afternoon that a travelling carriage with four posters thundered along Baker Street, to the great admiration of that semi-fashionable neighbourhood, and at length stopped at a house, the door of which was immediately opened by a footman wearing a livery of such varied colours that the rainbow was nothing to it. Diverse countenances appeared at the windows of the neighbouring dwellings, for it would seem that the travelling carriage, or rather the persons whom it contained, were an object of curiosity and interest to the elderly ladies in turbans in the drawing-rooms, and the servant-maids in the garrets, the latter of whom completely flattened their noses against the panes in their anxiety to obtain a view of the fashionably dressed gentleman who handed the magnificently attired lady from the vehicle, while the footman in the transcendent livery assisted the lady's maid to alight from the high seat behind and since all the neighbourhood of Baker Street appears to know right well who the arrivals are, we shall not affect any mystery with our readers, but plainly, distinctly, and at once declare that the fashionably dressed gentleman was Mr. Frank Curtis, and the magnificently attired lady was Mrs. Curtis, late Mrs. Goldberry. This excellent couple had just returned home after passing their honeymoon in the country, as all rich and fashionable people are bound to do, and five little Goldberries were crowding at the front door to welcome their mamma and their new papa. These specimens of the Goldberry race formed, in respect to their ages, an ascending scale commencing with number five and terminating with number thirteen, and exhibiting as much pleasing variety as could possibly exist in the pug nose species and the chubby face genus. These delightful children set up a perfect yell of joy, which was heard at least ten houses off, when their new papa assisted their old mamma to alight from the carriage, for Mrs. Goldberry could not be said to be young, she being on the shady side of forty, though blessed with such a juvenile family. "'Happy is the man,' says the psalmist, meaning also woman, "'who hath his quiver full of them.' but Mrs. Goldberry fancied that it rather spoilt the effect of a bride's return to behold a hall full of them. Nevertheless, she gave them each a maternal hug, and the youngest set up a shout because she did not give him a box of toys into the bargain. Let us suppose half an hour to have elapsed since the return of the happy pair. At the expiration of that period, we shall find them seated in the drawing-room, enjoying a pleasant tete-a-tete chat, until the early dinner, which had been ordered, should be duly announced by the rainbow-excelling footman. Mrs. Goldberry was, as above stated, a trifle past forty, although she never acknowledged to more than thirty-one. She was somewhat stout, had coarse masculine features, a tolerably good set of teeth, certainly fine eyes, and was as yet independent of the adventitious aids of the wig-maker and rouge manufacturer. Little of her history was known by Mr. Curtis until the period, a few weeks previously to the marriage, when he became acquainted with her through the simple process of picking up her youngest boy, who happened to fall into some mud one day when the lady and her children were taking a walk in the vicinity of Baker Street. This little act of politeness on the part of Frank had naturally led to the exchange of a few observations, the exchange of a few observations brought Mrs. Goldberry to her own door. Her own door admitted her into the house, whither Frank was politely invited to follow her. The following her in was followed by the serving up of luncheon. The luncheon led to increased communicativeness, and the communicativeness made Frank aware that his new acquaintance was the widow of the late Mr. Goldberry, gentleman and the undisputed possessor of a clear income of five thousand a year. Glorious news this for Frank, who suffered the lady to understand that he enjoyed a similar income, and then they laughed a great deal at the funny coincidence. 
when frank took his leave he requested permission to call again and this favour could not be refused to a gentleman who had picked the child out of the mud and who made five thousand a year thus frequent visits led to tender proposals the tender proposals ended in marriage and the marriage ended in but we are going on much too fast and therefore we must pause at the point indicated ere we commenced this brief digression namely at the tete-a-tete -tete discourse while awaiting the announcement of dinner well my love said frank here we are once more in london upon my word there's nothing like london after all as my friend the earl of blackwall says and yet i think we were very comfortable in the country frank observed mrs curtis late mrs goldberry with a simper as fascinating as she could possibly render a grimace formed by a large mouth oh but you and i can be happy anywhere dear said frank we mustn't remain in baker street though i shall take a slap-up house in grosvenor square if i can get one there at all events somewhere more in the fashionable quarter now i'll tell you what i've been thinking of and i'm sure that you'll approve of my plan you see there's all those dear children of yours i'm sure i love them as well as if i was their real father the darlings you're quite a duck frank exclaimed mrs curtis tapping him slightly on the face well i don't think i'm a bad fellow at all continued the young gentleman smoothing down his hair very complacently and the plan i'm going to propose to you will prove it indeed it's just what my very particular friend the marquis of woolwich did when he married under similar circumstances i mean a lady with a young family and what did his lordship do inquired mrs curtis he made this arrangement with his wife explained frank all his own property was to be left in the funds to accumulate for the benefit of the children never to be touched to be locked up like a rat in a trap as one might say and the lady's property was to serve for the household and all other expenses now this is just what i propose we shall do my hundred and forty thousand pounds shall be so locked up and your income my love will do for us to live upon in fact i'll make a will to-morrow settling all my fortune on you in case you survive me or on the children at your death it is astonishing how blank mrs curtis's countenance became as her beloved husband proposed this arrangement but she managed to hide her confusion from him by means of her handkerchief while he flattered himself that his generous consideration of her children had drawn tears from her eyes this little arrangement will decidedly be the best continued frank and i shall have the satisfaction of knowing that your dear children are well provided for in fact it was but the day before the happy one which united us that i met my friend the duke of gravesend and he was advising me how to act in the matter saying what he had done as i told you just now and his grace's authority is no mean one i can assure you my dear but you don't answer me what are you thinking about mrs curtis was thinking of a great deal a horrible idea had struck her was it possible that frank's vaunted property was all moonshine and that he was now inventing a means of concealing this fact from her she had been vain enough to suppose all along that he was enamoured of her person far more than of her alleged five thousand a year and he had given her so many assurances of the disinterestedness of his affection that she had congratulated herself on hooking him most completely she knew that he was the nephew of the rich sir christopher blunt and had readily believed therefore that he himself was rich also and experienced though she were in the ways of the world she had not instituted any inquiries to ascertain the truth of his assertions relative to his property in a word she fancied she had caught a green foolish but wealthy young fellow whereas she was now seized with the frightful apprehension that she had laboured under a complete delusion and this alarm was the more terrible as the reader may conceive when we inform him that she herself was a mere adventuress without a farthing of annual income derivable from any certain source and overwhelmed with debts 
her creditors having only been kept quiet for the last few weeks by her representations that she was about to marry a young gentleman of fortune in a word she had only taken the house in baker street on the hopeful speculation of catching some amorous old gentleman of property and she had deemed herself particularly fortunate when she received the proposals of an amorous young gentleman who in the course of conversation happened to intimate that he possessed five thousand a year mrs curtis's confusion and terror nay absolute horror may therefore be well conceived when the dreadful suspicion that she herself was as much taken in as her husband flashed to her mind you don't answer repeated frank what the deuce are you thinking of i was thinking my love replied the lady subduing her feelings as well as she could and still clinging to the faint hope that all might not be so bad as she apprehended i was thinking my love that your arrangement is not feasible for this simple reason that my fortune is so locked up and settled on my children i can only touch the dividends and i shall have nothing to receive till july moreover i run very short at my bankers now indeed i believe i have overdrawn them and so all things considered it will be impossible and unnecessary even if possible to carry your generous proposal into effect i didn't know your money was so locked up exclaimed frank looking mightily stupid in spite of his strenuous endeavours to appear perfectly happy and contented i thought your fortune was at your own disposal certainly the interest responded mrs curtis now finding by her husband's manner that her worst fears were considerably strengthened the devil murmured frank petulantly what did you say dearest asked the lady oh nothing love only that it doesn't signify at all so long as we have the interest of the money settled on your children and that's five thousand a year which with your five thousand a year makes us ten love added the lady eyeing him askance to be sure said frank and walking to the window he hummed a tune to conceal his desperate vexation this worthy pair had however each a consolation left one real the other imaginary the real consolation was on the side of the lady who had saved herself from the danger of a debtor's prison by marrying mr curtis the imaginary consolation was the idea which this gentleman nourished that his amiable spouse enjoyed at all events the annual income of five thousand pounds moreover as he glanced round the elegantly furnished drawing-room and in imagination at all the other apartments in the dwelling he thought to himself well hang it with five thousand a year and this splendid house i think i can manage to make myself pretty comfortable of course everything's paid for and that's a blessing scarcely had mr curtis disposed of this solacing reflection when the livery servant entered to announce that dinner was served up frank offered his arm to his lady in the most jaunty manner possible for as the reader may suppose he had many reasons to induce him to be uncommonly attentive to one who as he thought held the purse and the lady on her side accepted in a most charming manner the homage thus paid her because she was not as yet quite certain that her husband's property was really aerial and even if it should prove so he must become the scapegoat between herself and her ravenous creditors indeed the little tokens of endearment which the happy couple thought it fit to lavish upon each other as they descended the stairs created such huge delight on the part of the livery servant following them that this individual totally forgetting the dignity which should have accompanied such a gorgeous livery actually and positively diverted himself by means of that wonderful arrangement of the hands commonly called taking a sight the dinner passed off in the usual way and when the cloth was removed and the domestic was about to retire frank exclaimed in an authoritative manner john bring up a bottle of claret yes sir claret sir said the servant fidgeting about near the door and glancing uneasily towards his mistress 
who did not, however, happen to observe him. "'I specified claret as plain as I could speak, John,' said Mr. Curtis angrily, "'and so make haste about it.' "'Yes, sir, only—' again hesitated the domestic. "'Only what?' vociferated Frank. "'Only there ain't none, sir,' was the answer. "'No claret, John?' cried Mrs. Curtis, now taking part in the discussion. "'No, ma'am. There was but two bottles of wine left when you went away, ma'am, with master, and them's the port and sherry on the table now, ma'am.' "'John, you must be mistaken,' exclaimed Frank. "'Your mistress assured me that the cellar was well stocked.' "'Yes, my dear,' interrupted Mrs. Curtis, "'and I was so far right in telling you what I did, "'because on the very morning, the happy morning, dear, you know, "'when we went away, I wrote to Mr. Beeswing, my wine merchant, "'or rather, our wine merchant, I should say, "'to order in a good stock of port, sherry, champagne, and claret.' "'And what the devil, then, does Mr. Beeswing mean by this cursed neglect?' cried Frank. "'There's log, wood, and juice, my friend Lord Paddington's wine-merchants, who would be delighted to serve us. "'Did you know of this order, John, that your mistress gave?' Y "'Yes, sir, I did,' was the stammering reply, delivered with much diffidence and many twirlings of the white napkin.' "'Well, my dear, it is no use to make ourselves uncomfortable about the business,' said Mrs. Curtis, evidently anxious to quash the subject at once. "'You can put up with what there is to-day, and to-morrow you can give an order to your noble friend's wine merchants. That will do, John. You can retire.' "'No, by God, that will not do,' vociferated Frank. "'This fellow Beeswing has behaved most shamefully. It's a regular insult.' as the Prince of Gibraltar would call it. But I dare say he forgot it. And since you knew of the order, John, why the devil didn't you see that it was executed while we were away? My dear, began Mrs. Curtis, in a tone of remonstrance. Answer me, you fellow, cried Frank, turning in a threatening way towards the domestic, and unable to resist the opportunity of indulging his bullying propensities. "'Why the devil didn't you attend to the order given by your mistress?' "'Well, sir, and so I did,' responded the servant, now irritated by the imperious manner of his master. "'I went a dozen times to Beeswing's while you and Mrs. was away.' "'Frank, dear, do leave this to me,' urged the lady. "'No, my dear, this concerns me as the master of the house,' exclaimed Frank, looking very pompous and very fierce." "'Well, John, and what the deuce did Beeswing say when you did see him?' "'Please, sir, he said he'd rather not,' was the astounding answer. Mr. Frank Curtis looked aghast. "'I always knew he was the most insulting fellow in the world, that Beeswing,' cried the lady, colouring deeply and affecting violent indignation. "'But we will never deal with him again, I vow and declare. John!' "'Tell him to send in his bill. At once, mind.' "'He has, ma'am,' interrupted the servant. "'In fact, there's a many letters waiting for master.' "'Then why the devil didn't you give them to me before?' exclaimed Frank, not knowing precisely what to think of Mr. Beeswing's conduct, but in a very bad humour on account of the disappointment relative to the claret. John the servant made no reply to the question last put to him, but advancing towards the table— produced from his pocket about thirty letters and other documents, all of which he laid before his master, his countenance the while wearing a most curious and sinister expression, as much as to say, you're a very bumptious kind of young man, but these papers will perhaps bring you down a peg or two. You may retire, said Frank savagely, and this intimation was forthwith obeyed. Very curious conduct, that of Beeswing, my dear continued Mr. Curtis, as soon as the door had closed behind the servant. "'Very, dear, I can't make it out,' responded Mrs. Curtis. "'But pray don't bother yourself with those letters and papers now. They can't be very particular, and you will have more time to-morrow, dear.' "'Oh, I can look over them, and we can go on talking all the same,' said Frank, "'because I can't think how the deuce so many letters should be addressed to me here.' 
instead of at my own place. I mean, I shouldn't have thought that such a lot of my friends would have already heard of our union, love, he added, with a tender glance towards the lady, who was sitting very much in the style figuratively represented in common parlance as being on thorns. And Mr. Curtis's visual rays, having thus benignly bent themselves on his companion, were once more fixed on the pile of letters and documents lying before him. The lady tossed off a bumper of port and filled her glass again, in an evident fit of painful nervousness, while her husband opened the first letter, the contents of which ran as follows. Oxford Street. Sir, we beg to enclose our account for furniture supplied to Mrs. Curtis, late Mrs. Goldberry, and respectfully solicit an early settlement, as the bill has been running for a considerable time. Your obedient servants, Tuffle and Tunks. The devil! ejaculated Frank, as he cast his eyes over the enclosure. Bill delivered eight hundred and seventy six pounds, six shillings and sixpence. God bless my soul! That's a stinger! Why, I thought all the furniture must have been paid for, my dear. Not exactly, love, you perceive, returned the lady. One never pays an upholsterer's bill for so long a time, you know. Indeed, it quite slipped my memory. It's such a trifle. Well, so it is, dear, observed Frank, reassured by the calm and indifferent way in which his wife disposed of the trifle. And he proceeded to open another letter, which announced a second trifle in the ensuing manner. Furnival's Inn. Sir, we are desired by Messrs. Orr and Dross, jewellers, to apply to you for the payment of three hundred and seventy-seven pounds ten shillings, being the amount of debt contracted by your present wife, late Mrs. Goldberry, with our clients, and unless the same be paid, together with six shillings and eightpence for cost of this application, within three days from the date hereof, we shall be compelled to have recourse to ulterior measures without farther notice. Your obedient servants, Dawkins and Smasher. "'What a thundering lot of jewellery you must have, to be sure, dear!' exclaimed Frank, as he handed this letter to his wife. "'But, upon my soul, I think you've been rather extravagant, love, haven't you?' "'Oh, my dear, ladies must have jewellery, you know,' returned Mrs. Curtis. "'And after all I have paid ore and dross, I really am surprised at their importunity. "'But we will pay them, and have done with them, dear.' "'So we will, love.' responded Frank, and I'll ask my friend the Duke of Hampstead to recommend his jeweller to us. But here's a precious letter. Why, what the deuce? There's a dozen pawnbroker's tickets in it, I declare. Mrs. Curtis fell back almost senseless in her chair, while her husband perused the ensuing letter. I write, madam, to inform you that I can't sell the duplicates which you placed in my hands as secretary for me, Bill, as have you've married a gent which as property, I hope you'll now settle my bill, which has been a running for eighteen months, and I hope you'll settle it soon, leastways as soon as you come home, because I am in real want of it, being a lone widder, which has lost my husband, two year come midsummer, and having five young children, and another coming by accident, but I shan't do so no more and shall be very happy to go on washing for you when you've paid this bill, which is thirty-four pounds threepence. Dear madam, pray do this to oblige me the instant you come home. You can send it up by Mr. John, your footman, or as my little gal shall wait on you at any hour. You know I've never pressed you, and you took the duplicates to oblige you, but couldn't do nothing with them, and now they've run out, and it's no fault of mine because I'd no money to pay the interest and you was gone out of town with your new husband, which I ear is a very fine young man, which I'm glad to ear for your sake, dear madam. Excuse this long letter because the doctor should say I shall be confined this week and it's hard lines to have no money at such a time. I aren't sent home the last batch of linen because I were obliged to make a way with it but I send the duplicate of that as well as the duplicate of the watch and chain and other trinkets, which I hope you'll receive safe 
and now as you're all right and are a rich woman you'll not be angry with me for putting your linning up the spont at such a critical moment dear madam pray excuse this writing which i know is very bad but my pen is very bad and i'm in great pain while i write your obedient humble servant comarn susan spriggs merrily bone mrs curtis lane wigmore street baker cavendish street square madam it's all a cursed plant vociferated frank curtis starting from his seat and throwing down the letter during the perusal of which he had been scarcely able to control his impatience i see it all it's a cursed imposition an infernal plant and i'm a, a damned fool thus speaking the young gentleman shook his better half violently by the shoulders and she having nothing to urge in explanation of the extraordinary letter of her washerwoman screamed just loud enough to appear hysterical without alarming the servants and went off into a fit as a matter of course fool duped done brown by god exclaimed curtis as he began to pace the room with no affected agitation saddled with a wife and five children overwhelmed with her debts and my own and what's a just sight worse made an ass off i've regularly sold myself as my friend the duke no damn the duke i'm in no humour for dukes and that kind of nonsense now i don't know a duke and never did and never shall and so it's no use telling a parcel of lies any more plague take this old cat with her half dozen brats or near upon that number and plague take you then screeched the newly married lady recovering with most surprising abruptness from her fit and starting up like a fury why you swindling scoundrel how dare you call me names i'll tear your eyes out i will if you say over again what you've just said i say you're a regular adventuress cried frank and you are an impostor a cheat yelled the lady your fortune is all a gammon exclaimed curtis and yours all moonshine retorted his wife you've taken me in shameful and you've done the same to me you're cried frank nearly suffocating with rage and so are you whatever you're going to call me vociferated the late mrs goldberry curtis was unable to give forth any rejoinder and mrs curtis resuming her seat had recourse to the truly feminine alternative of bursting into tears a long pause ensued constituting a truce to recriminations and vituperations for several minutes and affording the pair leisure for reflection we will describe the ideas that gradually expanded in their minds as such explanation will the more easily prepare the reader for the result of the quarrel frank curtis on his side recognized the grand truth that what was done could not be undone and then he came to the philosophical conviction that it would be prudent to make the best of a bad job he reflected on the folly of an exposure which would be attended with immediate ruin bringing about his ears a host of creditors who would only become the more clamorous when they were brought in contact with each other and were placed in a condition to ascertain their number and compare the amounts of their claims he fancied that by allowing himself to be represented as a man of property his wife might silence the creditors for a time during which the war could be carried on and though an explosion must sooner or later take place yet it was some consolation to the young gentleman to think that the evil day might be postponed by keen manoeuvring and skilful generalship he feared being laughed at much more than the idea of a debtor's prison and delay was everything to a man in his desperate circumstances there was no telling what might turn up and he thought that if he could only dazzle the eyes of his uncle sir christopher with fine stories relative to the brilliancy of the match which he had formed with the late mrs goldberry he might contrive to wheedle a large sum of money out of the old gentleman on some such pretext as a desire to discharge diverse debts and a disinclination to confess to his wife that he had contracted them on the other hand mrs curtis fell into a similar train of thought 
it would, she fancied, be easy for her to visit the numerous creditors, assure them that she had as yet intercepted all the letters they had written to her husband, and implore them not to ruin her, in his good opinion, by exposing her liabilities to him. She even arranged in her head the very words which she would use when calling on them. My husband is about to sell an estate in Ireland, and the moment the purchase money is paid, I am sure to be enabled to obtain from him a sum sufficient to liquidate all my debts. Have a little forbearance, therefore, and all will be well. Thus she also recognised the utter inutility and monstrous folly of exposing themselves by means of quarrels, and as their minds were, by these parallel systems of reasoning, prepared for reconciliation, or at least the show of it, the making up of their dispute was no very difficult matter. Frank was the one to break the ice with the first overture. "'Well, I think we're two pretty fools,' he said, approaching the chair in which she was rocking herself to and fro. "'Don't you?' "'To alarm all the house, and let our servants know everything,' added the lady. "'No, no, it isn't so bad as that yet,' returned Frank. "'But I vote that we have no more quarrels.' "'I am sure I agree to the proposition, Frank,' was the answer. "'It's carried, then, without a dissentient voice,' exclaimed Curtis. "'As my friend the Duke—' "'Let us have no more falsehoods,' interrupted his wife. "'You said just now that you knew no Duke, never had known one, and never should. "'But I thought you was in a fit at that moment, my dear,' said Frank. "'Maybe I was, but still I could hear all that passed, as you very well know. "'However—' Let us be good friends, and hold a consultation how we are to proceed. Good, cried Frank. And we will begin with a glass of wine each. There, let us drink each other's health. Here's to you, my dear. And now to business. I suppose all these letters and bills are about unpaid debts of yours? Precisely so, love, answered Mrs. Curtis. How much do you think they amount to? "'About eighteen hundred pounds, I should say.' "'And how much money have you got towards paying them, dear?' inquired Frank. Eighteen pence, love,' responded the lady, extracting that sum from her pocket. There was a pause, during which Frank Curtis refilled the glasses, and then the happy pair looked inquiringly at each other, as much as to ask, "'Well, what shall we do?' "'This is devilish awkward,' observed Frank. "'But I'll tell you what I've been thinking of. "'I am all attention, dear,' said his better half. "'Mr. Curtis then conveyed in words "'the substance of those reflections which we have recorded above, "'and which had bent his mind towards a reconciliation. "'I entirely approve of all you say,' remarked Mrs. Curtis, "'and I will now tell you what I have been thinking of. "'Fire away, love,' was her husband's encouraging observation. The lady detailed in her turn the reflections which had occupied her mind a few minutes previously. "'Then we both hold the same opinions,' exclaimed Frank. "'Exactly. And if we play our cards well, there is no immediate danger of anything,' remarked the lady. "'But all the threatened writs, the probability of a sudden arrest—' and the clamours of such small tradesmen and other persons as your delectable washerwoman, who is about to add to her family two years after the death of her husband, exclaimed Frank interrogatively. I have trinkets, plate, and such like things, which will realise a hundred pounds, said Mrs. Curtis, and with that sum we can settle the little claimants, who are always more noisy and clamorous than the large ones. The colloquy had just reached this highly satisfactory point, when a tremendous double knock threatened to beat in the front door, and the bell was instantaneously afterwards set ringing in frantic accompaniment. "'Someone's ill!' cried Frank. "'And they take this house for a doctor's!' "'At all events it is no done,' observed Mrs. Curtis. 
Here the thundering knock and insane ring were repeated. "'I just tell you what, my dear,' resumed the young gentleman, rising from his chair and looking as fierce as possible. "'I've a just great mind to go out and ask who the devil it is that dares knock and ring twice in half a minute at our door in that fashion. I'm certain it's no friend of yours, and it's none of mine.' So, as sure as my name is Francis Curtis, Esquire of Baker Street, I'll... But at this instant, the dining-room door was thrown open by the domestic in gorgeous livery, and the countenance of the warlike Francis Curtis, Esquire of Baker Street, grew white as a sheet, while the servant announced, Captain O'Blunderbuss! End of section 76Section 77 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Captain O'Blunderbuss again. Be Jesus! "'And it is my dear friend, Mr. Frank Curtis,' exclaimed the redoubtable officer, as he stalked into the room. Then, perceiving the lady, he untiled his head in a most graceful manner, or in plain terms removed his foraging cap with a certain rounding sweep of his right arm, saying, "'Your servant, ma'am, I presume that I have the honour to pay my respects to Mrs. Curtis.' "'Yes, that is Mrs. Curtis, Captain,' said Frank, while the lady gave a somewhat cold inclination of the head. "'And a sweet and elegant wife you've got, you dog,' cried the Captain, bestowing a friendly poke in the ribs of the newly married gentleman. "'Come, shake hands, Mr. Curtis. Men like you and me mustn't harbour animosity against each other. Let the past be past, as the saying is, and an excellent saying it is too, ma'am.' he added, in a tone of bland appeal to the lady, as he nearly wrung her husband's fingers off in the enthusiasm of his anxiety to convince him that this time, at least, he came for no hostile purpose. "'Sit down, Captain,' said Frank, now feeling more at his ease than he had done since the unexpected appearance of the famous duellist. "'Will you take a glass of wine? There's port and sherry on the table.' and there is champagne, claret, hock, and burgundy in the cellar, as well as capital whisky. "'Be the holy poker!' exclaimed Captain O'Blunderbuss. "'And I'll just trouble you for the poteen. The true Irish poteen, ma'am,' he continued, turning once more towards Mrs. Curtis, "'is the most elegant beverage under the sun. On my estates on old Ireland I allow no water at all, and my peasantry is the finest to be seen in the whole country. "'Indeed, sir,' observed Mrs. Curtis, beginning to grow amused with the strange character who had thus intruded himself upon the momentous discussion which she and her husband were carrying on at the time. "'Pachesus, ma'am, and it's as true as you're sitting there,' exclaimed the captain. "'In my own country, ma'am, I'm a justice of the peace, and I never allow my peasantry to be interfered with by the gaugers.' I let them keep as many illicit stills as they like, and the consequence is, they adore me. I should think that to be very likely, said Frank. But here's the whisky, and there's hot water. Now, John, put the sugar on the table, that's right. The servant having retired, Captain O'Blunderbuss proceeded to compound his favourite beverage by mixing equal parts of spirit and water, and adding thereto three lumps of sugar. "'I always brew the first glass strong, ma'am,' he observed, "'in honour to old Ireland. Your health, ma'am.' "'But I'm not Irish, sir,' responded the lady, laughing. "'Then I'm sure ye ought to be, ma'am,' cried the captain. "'And be Jesus, if ye was, ye'd be an honour to the country.' Mrs. Curtis simpered and bowed in acknowledgment of the compliment. "'Come, old fellow,' said Frank, "'you needn't mind my wife being present.' She's a woman of the world, as my friend, the Archbishop of Paris, used to say of his niece, and so you may as well tell us how you managed to get out of a certain place, 
and what made you think of honouring us with this visit? Och, be Jesus, I'll answer the last question first, Mr. Curtis, responded the captain. Well then, you must know that I've taken a great affection for you, because, be the powers, I've heard speak of your bravery in a many quarters, and it isn't me that would cherish animosity against a gallant fellow. The captain might have added that, being in want of grog, supper, and lodging, he had racked his brain all day to think of some soft, easy individual amongst his acquaintance, on whom he could quarter himself for a week or so, and having at length remembered to have seen the marriage of Mr. Curtis and Mrs. Goldberry duly announced at the time in the fashionable newspapers, the said announcements having been duly paid for as a matter of course, it had struck him that he might make himself very comfortable in Baker Street for a short period. "'Well, I feel highly flattered by your good opinion of me,' said Frank. "'It's quite true that I've killed a man or two in my time, and winged half a dozen others. "'But really, those are trifles which one scarcely thinks of any value. "'At the same time, Captain, we duelists, you know, are devilish cheery of our reputation, "'and so it's just as well that the world should talk in a respectful way about us, eh?' "'With a holy poker, and you're right, my boy.' exclaimed the captain, mixing the second glass of grog. Then, turning towards Mrs. Curtis, he said, I always make my second jorum, mim, a little stronger than the first, for the honour of old England, because that's always my second toast. So here's to old England. And now, continued Captain O'Blunderbuss, after having taken a long draught of the potent liquor, I'll answer your first question, Mr. Curtis, and sure it's how i got out of limbo that you was asking about well i'll tell you and be jesus you'll say that such a rum start never was seen the cowardly bastes locked me up in horsemonger lane you know at the suit of one spriggins for three hundred and forty seven pounds including costs for three whole days i was just for all the world like a rampageous lion there's an infernal iron grating all round the yard where the prisoners have to walk about. And be Jesus, I chafed and foamed inside those bars, till the other prisoners got so frightened they sent a petition to the governor to get me locked up in the strong room. So the governor sends for me and says he, Captain O'Blunderbuss, you're a terror to the other people in the debtor's department of the prison, and you'd better be after thinking of making some arrangement with your creditor or I shall be forced to put you by yourself in the strong room. Be Jesus, says I, and I'll skin any man who shall dare to lay even the tip of a finger on me for such a purpose. Well, says the governor, but if you've ever so little in the shape of ready money to offer your creditor, I'll see him myself and try what I can do for you. So I pulled out my purse, and behold you, a jest two pound three shillings and sixpence, to pay three hundred and forty-seven pounds with. Is it three halfpence in the pound you'll be after offering? asks the governor. Just that same, says I, and if ever Mr. Spriggins gets another farthing out of me, then I'll skin myself. So away goes the governor to the creditor, and heaven only knows what blarney he pitches him, but in the course of a day or two, down comes a discharge, on condition that I pay the three halfpence in the pound. Now, says I, that treatin' an Irish gentleman as he deserves. And so I got clean out of that infernal place. Here's your health, ma'am. And the captain emptied his glass. You managed that business capital, exclaimed Frank Curtis, who began to think that it would be no bad speculation to maintain the martial gentleman altogether in Baker Street to frighten away the creditors, or at all events to employ him to go round to them in case they should prove inclined to act in a hostile manner towards him. At that moment his eyes met those of his wife, and the glance of intelligence which was exchanged between them showed that the same thought had struck them both, and at the same time. "'Help yourself, Captain,' said Frank. "'That whisky was sent me as a present by the Crown Prince of Denmark, for having been second to his illustrious wife's uncle's stepmother's first cousin's nephew, in a duel three years ago. "'Blood and thunder!' ejaculated Captain O'Blunderbuss. "'What a distant relation! But the poteen is beautiful, 
I always mix my third glass stronger than the first two, because in this same third I drink to the ladies, the sweethearts, and God bless them. Mrs. Curtis again acknowledged the compliment with a simper and an inclination of the head, and by the time the captain had disposed of his third glass, the domestic in transcendent livery announced that coffee was served in the drawing-room. Thither the party accordingly proceeded, Captain O'Blunderbuss escorting Mrs. Curtis with a politeness which would have been perfectly enchanting had he not smelt so awfully of poteen. And now, in a few minutes, behold the trio seated so cosily and comfortably at the table in the drawing-room, sipping the nectar of mocha, while a friendly little contest took place between Frank and the captain to decide who could tell the greatest number of lies in the shortest space of time. "'Be Jesus!' cried O'Blunderbuss. "'This coffee is an elegant beverage. "'But save in your presence, ma'am, "'it don't come up to the coffee which I grew on my own estate in old Ireland. "'The truth was, I had such a vast extent of bogland "'that I was at a loss what used to turn it to. "'So I sent my steward off to Arabia. "'Yes, be the holy poker, direct off to Arabia, "'to buy up as much coffee as he could get for money. "'Och, and with a power of coffee berries did he come back.' in the next West Indiaman, up the Mediterranean. And wasn't it a sown of them same berries that we had in the bog? You should have seen the land eight months afterwards, with the coffee plants grown up bigger than gooseberry bushes, and making the whole country smell of coffee for eight miles round. I realised seven hundred pounds by that speck the first year, and I have gone on with the culture of coffee ever since. Oh, said Frank, it is astonishing what improvements might be introduced in that way, if one only had the sense to do it. When I was staying in Paris, I was very intimate with the governor of the Bank of France, and he had a beautiful conservatory on the top of the bank. He took me up one day to see it. It was in the middle of winter, and cold as the devil in the open air, but warm as a toast inside the conservatory. Well, there I saw melons as large as a bombshell, growing in flower-pots no bigger than that slop-basin, pineapples hanging over the sides of teacups, and a kind of fruit, the name of which I've forgotten, but I know that it was as large as a horse's head, and of the same shape. So I said to my friend, the governor of the mint, says I, Mr. Curtis stopped, for the radiant footman entered the room, saying, Please, sir, two men wish to speak to you immediately. Two men, exclaimed Frank, casting an uneasy glance towards his wife, who, it was evident, shared her husband's very natural apprehensions. "'Yes, sir, but here they are,' added the footman. Then, turning round towards the intruders, he said, "'Why didn't you wait quiet down in the hall till I'd informed Master that you wanted to speak to him?' "'Cause we doesn't do business in that air way, old feller responded a voice which was not altogether unknown to either Mr. Curtis or the captain. "'Prog's the officer, by God!' vociferated the latter, starting from his seat. "'Yes, it's me and my master, Mr. McGrab, at your service, gentlemen,' said Proggs, pushing his way past the footman, and entering the room with his hat on his head and his stout stick in his hand. "'Please, Mr. Curtis, sir, you're wanted.' And as these words were uttered by the subordinate, the principal himself, namely Mr. McGrab, made his appearance, and a very dirty one it was too, in the doorway, while the footman stood aghast, and Mrs. Curtis went off into hysterics. "'Wanted?' cried Frank, casting an appealing glance towards the captain. "'Who the devil wants me?' "'Whose suit is it at, sir?' asked Proggs, turning towards his superior. Beeswing, wine merchant, debt two hundred pounds, owing by the lady, answered Mr. McGrab. Is it arresting my friend Mr. Curtis, you mean? demanded Captain O'Blunderbuss, advancing towards the officers with tremendous fierceness, now that he found his own personal security unendangered. And why not? growled McGrab, shrouding himself behind his man Proggs. Is it why not you're after asking? shouted Captain O'Blunderbuss. 
Now, be Jesus, and if you don't both make yourselves as scarce as you was before you was born, it's myself that'll teach you a lesson of politeness in the twinkling of a bedpost. Oh, that's all gammon, muttered Proggs. Mr. Curtis must either pay the money or come along with us. He won't do neither the one nor the t'other, you beast of the earth, exclaimed the captain. I say now, began McGrab, but before he had time to utter another word, the redoubtable captain wrenched the short stick from the hands of Mr. Proggs, and throwing it to a distance, boldly attacked the officers with his long sinewy arms, in such an effectual manner that they disappeared from the drawing-room in as short a space of time as their assailant had represented by that beautiful figure of rhetoric, the twinkling of a bedpost. Mrs. Curtis had deemed it most prudent to go off into a fit. Frank was nailed to the floor by the terror of being captured and dragged off to a debtor's prison. The footman considered it wise to remain a mere spectator of the fight, and thus the captain was unassisted in his gallant onslaught upon the sheriff's officer and his man. The captain, however, had an advantage on his side namely that when he had once succeeded in driving the enemy back as far as the staircase it was comparatively an easy matter to fling them headlong down a feat which he performed without the least ceremony or hesitation to the infinite alarm of the female servants in the kitchen who came rushing up into the hall from that lower region screaming as heartily as they could under the conviction that the house was tumbling about their ears hold your pace my dears exclaimed Captain O'Blunderbuss, rushing down the stairs after the vanquished enemy, his countenance purple with whisky and excitement, every vein in his forehead swollen almost to bursting, and his fists clenched for a renewal of the onslaught. "'We'll make you smart for this, my man,' growled McGrab, as he rose painfully from the hall floor. "'I'm jiggered if we don't do,' added Proggs, picking himself up, as it were, from the last step and feeling his legs and arms, to see if any of his bones were broken. "'Out of the house, ugly beasts at ye are!' thundered the captain. The officers had received sufficient evidence of the redoubtable gentleman's warlike propensities to induce them to beat a rapid retreat, and the moment they had evaporated by the front door, the captain banged it violently after them, securing it with bolts and chain. "'That's the way we serve out the reptiles in old Ireland, my dears,' he exclaimed, turning towards the female servants, who, having at length comprehended the nature of the amusement going on, had ceased to scream, and were enjoying the animated scene as much as if it had been a play. Frank Curtis had heard the front door close violently, and the drawing of the bolts afterwards convinced him that the house was cleared of its invaders. He accordingly descended the stairs, laughing heartily now that the immediate peril had been averted by the prowess of the captain. The resplendent footman was following close behind his master, very anxious to solicit his wages and his discharge there and then, and only prevented from acting thus abruptly by the formidable presence of Captain O'Blunderbuss. "'Now, my friends,' exclaimed this gallant gentleman, who was quite in his element under existing circumstances, the house is in a complete state of siege. You must look to me as the commander of the garrison. So let the area and the ground floor windows be all properly fastened. Take care of the back door, wherever it leads to. And be Jesus, we'll keep the rascals out. I know em well. They'll be trying all manner of dodges to get in. But they'll find themselves as mistaken as the old lady was when she scratched the bedpost and thought she was scratching her head. Then, with wonderful alacrity, Captain O'Blunderbuss hastened to superintend the arrangements and the precautions which he had briefly suggested. He examined the windows in the drawing-room, he descended to the kitchen, went out into the area, poked his nose into the coal-cellar, inspected the yard at the back, issued his orders, saw that they were executed, and then drank off half a tumbler of whisky neat, both as a slight refreshment after the exertions of the evening and as a token of his satisfaction at the various measures which he had adopted with a view to convert the house into an impregnable fortress by this time mrs curtis had made up her mind to recover from her fit 
but she was so dreadfully shocked at the exposure which had taken place before the servants that she retired to her bedchamber forthwith the captain and frank then sat down to hold as the former gentleman expressed it a council of war and as one bottle of whisky had been emptied and there was not another in the house the martial gentleman was kind and condescending enough to put up with gin of which exhilarating fluid he found to his great satisfaction there was a large supply in the cellar what the devil would you have me do in this cursed embarrassment asked frank be jesus and i'll just tell you now answered the captain let me see this is tuesday well we must maintain the siege until sunday and then you must give the trap's leg bail into another county whose furniture is it in the house why it's ours and it isn't responded frank oh and be easy now i understand you my boy cried the captain it isn't paid for you mean but position is nine points of the law and by the holy poker we'll make it the whole twelve just allow me to carry you through this little affair next sunday night my lad you must be off into surrey with the lady and little ones and leave me to manage here on monday at the top of the morning i'll have in a broker and sell off every stick and i'll bring you over the proceeds like a man of honour as i am so far so good said frank but how are we to get things to eat between this and sunday if no one is to stir out of the place is it eating you mean when there's three gallons of gin in the house demanded captain o'blunderbuss with something like indignation in his tone and manner well but the wife and the children can't live upon gin captain observed frank even though the servants should have no objection not live upon gin me boy vociferated captain o'blunderbuss in a state of astonishment as complete and unfeigned as if some one had just shown him his own name in the army list or presented him with the title deeds of his often vaunted irish estates not live upon gin mr curtis he repeated surveying frank as if this young gentleman were actually taking leave of his senses show me the discontented mortal my friend that says he won't live upon gin and i'll just just what asked frank somewhat dismayed at this irascibility on the part of his companion i'll skin him by the holy poker cried captain o'blunderbuss rapping his clenched fist violently upon the table there was a long pause during which the two gentlemen emptied and refilled their glasses by the way me boy suddenly exclaimed the captain as if an idea had just struck him is that old uncle of yours in town at present yes he came back some days ago i understand replied frank do you think he'd plead asked the captain for tis supplies to carry on the war in an elegant style for a long time to come that we want since now that we're once on a friendly footing together curtis i'm not the boy to desert ye in your troubles he might have added that he would stick to mr and mrs curtis so long as they had a bottle of spirits to give or a shilling to lend him i really think that it's very likely you might be able to draw the old bird said frank and to tell you the truth i had already entertained the idea besides he won't dare refuse you captain be jesus i should take it as an insult if he did exclaimed the man of war caressing his moustache but let us strike the iron while it is hot throw up a letter to sir christopher in your best style and i'll be off with it at once trust me for getting out of the garrison safe and coming back again in the same way but mind you keep a sharp watch while i'm gone frank promised compliance with this injunction and hastened to pen a letter to his uncle the captain kindly undertaking to dictate the sense in which it was to be written the precious document ran as follows my dear uncle i hope this will find you blooming as it leaves me and as you and me have both made ourselves happy by marriage don't let us have any more animosity between us in fact i will show you at once that i mean to forget the past and treat you as an uncle ought to be treated by his dutiful nephew well then to come to the point my friend captain o'blunderbuss whom you have the pleasure of knowing and who improves vastly on acquaintance 
has kindly lent me five hundred pounds, just to settle a few pressing debts, which I had contracted during the time that I was so unfortunate as to be on bad terms with you. And as the captain wants his money again, and I don't like to tell my wife, so soon after marriage, that I owe this sum, you will greatly oblige me by giving the captain a cheque for the amount, or else bank notes at once. He isn't very particular which, I dare say. And I will repay you the moment I get my quarter's allowance, as the beloved and angelic creature whom I shall have so much pleasure in introducing to you and to my dear Aunt Charlotte, has promised me seven hundred pounds every three months to spend as I like and no questions asked. So no more at present, my dear uncle, from your dutiful, attached, obliged and grateful nephew, Francis Curtis. What do you think of that? demanded Frank triumphantly, when he had read the letter aloud for the opinion of his friend. Is it what I think? exclaimed the captain. By the powers! and it's as well as I could have done it myself, if I'd studied it for a week. Thanks to your suggestions, added Frank, and now I'll just seal and direct it while you finish your glass. Captain O'Blunderbuss did drain the contents of his tumbler, as Frank foresaw that he would do, for it was one of that gallant gentleman's maxims never to waste good liquor and being thus fortified with upwards of a pint of whisky and ditto of gin, the effects of which were evident only in the fiery hue of his complexion, but by no means in his gait nor speech, he prepared to set out on his expedition to the dwelling of Sir Christopher Blunt. "'Frank,' said he, putting on his foraging cap and conveying the letter to his pocket, "'take the poker.' "'The poker?' repeated the young man with mingled surprise and dismay. And what else would you take to dash out the brains of any man who should try to spring in at the door while I go out? exclaimed O'Blunderbuss. That's right, me boy, he added, as Curtis shouldered the fire implement. Not that it's likely for any of them bastes of the earth to be lurking about so soon after the little affair of just now, but it's as well to be on our guard. Accordingly, Frank Curtis stood behind the front door, poker in hand, as the redoubtable officer issued forth. But the coast was clear so far as the retainers of the sheriff were concerned, and the peace of the garrison remained unmolested. Frank closed, chained, and bolted the door again, and Captain O'Blunderbuss wended his way with an awful swagger down the street, frightening by his fierce looks all the small children whom he happened to encounter. End of section 77